The Ministry of Secondary Education has developed a distance learning platform for students of secondary education in Cameroon. A series of lessons taught by qualified teachers for secondary school students. Under the stewardship of Professor Pauline Nalovalyonga, in collaboration with the Ministry of Posts and Telecommunications, CAMTEL, CRTV and UNESCO. We are introducing distance learning as another teaching and learning method which is different from the traditional classroom setting that you are all used to. In the distance education mode, you are not with the teacher in person, so take your time, relax, listen to the teacher, take down notes and visit the following links for any questions or answers to your questions. Take it in your stride. This is Cameroon's solution to COVID-19 and beyond. Professor Nalova Lyunga, Minister of Secondary Education. Welcome to our distance education lesson for today. I am Bagoya Frederick, your human biology teacher. In this lesson, we shall be looking at nutrition in plants. And our focus shall be on factors affecting the rate of photosynthesis. It should be recalled that when we look at nutrition in plants, we are talking about autotrophic nutrition because plants manufacture their food by themselves. And we have seen earlier that in the process of photosynthesis, carbon dioxide and water are combined in the chloroplast using energy from the sun to produce glucose molecule, which is stored or transformed into fats or into starch. And oxygen is also given out. In this process, therefore, what are the factors that affect it? That will be the focus for this lesson, as we shall see the first part of these factors. There are several, but we'll start to see some in this lesson. As plan of activity, after looking at the objectives, we shall have the previous knowledge, a real life situation, lesson activities, we shall do some exercises, and then we shall have an assignment. But before we continue with this plan of activity, it is important for us to look at the assignment we had in the previous lesson. And our task was, if light was taken away from tomato plants by covering them with a thick dark cloth, how might their productivity be affected? In your reflections on this task, you certainly had some points which you brought up, which may be similar or the same with the ones that we have. But here are some of the plausible responses that could happen if tomatoes are covered with a dark plot. There will be poor growth of the plants, which will be observed. And if there's poor growth, then what about the yield? Certainly poor. The leaves will become yellowish, there will be weak and stringy stems. There will be few flowers produced, and the few fruits that will be born will be in small sizes. Therefore, there will be a significant reduction in the productivity. This is a process we call etiolation, as we are going to see later on. <laughs> What, therefore, are the lesson objectives for today? By the end of this lesson, let us should be able to state and explain how at least three environmental factors can affect the rate of photosynthesis. In the previous knowledge required for this lesson is a general understanding of the process or the stages of photosynthesis because we'll use that to look at the factors that affect the rate. Remember, Rate is the speed at which photosynthesis takes place. Is it taking place faster, slower, or normal? What could cause it to be faster? What could retard it? Those are the things that we shall be looking at in this lesson. Let us share this hypothetical real life situation and see how our knowledge from this lesson shall help us to tackle it. To prevent her huckleberries from being consumed by stray goods, a vegetable farmer decided to cover her garden entirely with a large black polythene sheet. 
On the day of the expected harvest, after one week, she was surprised to realize that all her vegetables had become yellowish and with very few leaves. What, therefore, could be an advice which could be given to this farmer? She had virtually nothing to harvest and attributed this sudden change to witchcraft. Was she right? Can you prove witchcraft scientifically? Let us see how a human biology student with knowledge of factors affecting rate of photosynthesis can clarify this doubt from the mind of such a farmer. We shall see this in the course of this lesson. And from this situation, we observe that covering of vegetables with black pollen sheep caused them to develop tiny and yellowish leaves. This is a process we call etiolation. We shall still see it in a short while. What hypothesis, therefore, could we draw from this? Absence of light leads to poor growth of plants. That is an alternate hypothesis. Now, let's look at this. From the equation below, would a plant growing in marshy soil carry out more photosynthesis than the one on a hill slope? What do we mean by marshy soil? We mean an area that is water tight. It has a lot of water. Will the presence of that water in that land make that plant to carry out more photosynthesis than the plant growing on a hill or on the slope? Here is the equation for photosynthesis. Carbon dioxide plus, wat plus water gives glucose and oxygen. And we have sunlight, energy, and we have chlorophyll, which is trapped by in the chloroplast. Reflection here is that water and carbon dioxide are raw materials for photosynthesis. If the amount of water determines the rate of photosynthesis, then the plant in the marshy area will photosynthesize more. But this is not the case. Why is it not the case scientifically? We see that there are two groups of factors that affect the rate of photosynthesis. There are external or environmental factors, and there are internal or physiological factors. Water is an external factor. Therefore, the provision of an external factor alone without the internal factor may not actually increase the rate of photosynthesis. We shall look at these factors, how they affect the rate of photosynthesis. Let's start with the environmental factors. And the first here, we look at light. Light comes from the sun. Light actually supplies the energy that is used to split water molecules in the process of photolysis. And this increases, increase in light intensity, light intensity would certainly increase the number and speed of water molecules that are being split. But if this light intensity is increased indefinitely, will it continue to increase the rate of photosynthesis? We see that for light intensity to be increased, and as it increases, more water molecules are split and more solar energy is harvested. But this is done if other factors are available. Because other factors, if not available, become limiting factors. But this increase in rate of photosynthesis with all factors available goes only up to an optimal level. And after that, it stops. It remains at that level because other factors become limiting. At this point, if water molecules are being split with the increase in light intensity, when the light intensity becomes excess, you see that the water molecules also become limited and they need extra supply. Very high light intensities bleach the chlorophyll and slows down the rate of photosynthesis. Decrease in light intensity decreases the rate of photosynthesis. And this can be seen in this curve where we have rate of photosynthesis and light intensity. At the start, when light intensity is increasing, you see that the rate of photosynthesis is increasing. But at a certain high light intensity, the rate remains constant. It doesn't change because the water might have been used up and even the chlorophyll might have been bleached 
and all the like. So this is a graphical representation of the rate of photosynthesis as a function of light intensity. We also look at carbon dioxide concentration. Carbon dioxide supplies the carbon that is used to make carbohydrates. And this, if there's an increase in carbon dioxide concentration, there is also an increase in the amount of carbohydrate being formed. But would this go on indefinitely? More solar energy will be converted to adenosine triphosphate. And also, the rate of photosynthesis will increase, but this goes up to optimum. And above this optimal point or this optimal rate, the further increase does not increase the rate of photosynthesis as the hydroxyl ions become limited. You also see that decrease in carbon dioxide concentration also decreases the rate of photosynthesis because it is this carbon dioxide that supplies the carbon that produces the carbohydrate. Graphically, it can also be represented as such we will have the rate of photosynthesis and carbon dioxide concentration. Here we see that increasing the carbon dioxide concentration increases the rate of photosynthesis, but up to optimum, after which increase in carbon dioxide concentration have no effect. The rate remains constant, provided other limiting factors are in optimal supply. We also look at temperature. What is the effect of temperature on the rate of photosynthesis. We see that high temperatures increase the rate of physiological reactions in all living things, including humans, like you and I. But in relation to photosynthesis, does this increase in temperature continue to increase the rate of photosynthesis for eternity? It isn't the case. Increase in temperature from the initial starting point increases the rate of splitting water molecules, that is, rate of photolysis. And this also increases the rate of formation of carbohydrate molecules. But this only goes on to the optimal temperature. Because when the temperatures go above optimum, further increase does not increase the rate of photosynthesis anymore. But it will rather cause destruction of enzymes and even make enzymes inactivated, thereby even decreasing the rate. Also, decrease in temperature decreases the rate of enzymatic activity and also other physiological processes that go on in plants and other living things. Therefore, the rate of photosynthesis will reduce with decrease in temperature, but will increase with increase in temperature up to optimum. This can be represented graphically as such. We see that unlike the effect of carbon dioxide, and sunlight or light intensity, increase in temperature increases rate of photosynthesis. But when it reaches optimal temperature, the rate of photosynthesis decreases and it can even go down to zero because enzymes involved are inactivated. The enzymes are killed and as such, the process doesn't continue. Also, the temperature when it is too high it, it even kills some of the cells of the plants. Therefore, those chloroplasts that would have been photosynthesizing are already destroyed by the excess temperature. Therefore, you see that temperature rises. As temperature rises, the rate rises, but at optimum, further increases lead to a decrease in rate of photosynthesis. It is imperative for us to recall that there were two broad groups of factors that affect the rate of photosynthesis. We had environmental factors and we also had internal factors or physiological factors. And these environmental factors, they include light intensity, carbon dioxide concentration, and temperature. These are things that come from the environment. The plant does not have direct control over these factors. But these factors interplay with the internal factors to affect the rate of photosynthesis. For light intensity, carbon dioxide concentration and temperature, their increases will increase the rate of photosynthesis, but up to optimum, and the rate will remain constant. Further increases will have no effect as other factors become limiting factors. 
and they become limited and determine the rate of the photosynthesis. Decrease in these factors also limit the rate of photosynthesis by decreasing it. Also, when we relate to temperature, we realize that there's a difference in temperature because increases in temperature after optimum decreases the rate of photosynthesis. Let us look at the review of the real life situation we had seen. Here, we had seen that to prevent huckleberries from being consumed by stray goods, a vegetable farmer decided to cover her garden entirely with a large black polythene sheet. On the day of the expected harvest, after one week, she was surprised to realize that all her vegetables had become yellowish and with very few leaves. She had virtually nothing to harvest and attributed this sudden change to witchcraft. As a human biology student and as a science student, was she right? In reflecting on this, we have the following comments that will come up. What certainly happened based on the knowledge acquired from this lesson? We see that covering plants with black pollution sheets prevented light from reaching the plants. Remember, light is an environmental factor that affects the rate of photosynthesis. Therefore, covering these vegetables with a black cloth already eliminated light from reaching into those plants. We have also seen that reducing light intensity reduces the rate of photosynthesis. Therefore, covering these plants implies reducing the productivity rate of these vegetables by reducing the rate of photosynthesis. And in so doing, the rate of photosynthesis is reduced significantly. Most of the chlorophyll becomes exhausted due to continuous darkness, and then the leaves become yellowish. This is how the yellowish color of the leaves develops. Also, lack of photosynthesis leads to lack of nutrients to build up plant tissue, thus the tiny nature of leaves. The vegetables become etiolated. We are going to look at this etiolation in a short while, some samples, and such a protective method should be done with transparent polythene sheets to allow the passage of light. If the vegetables or the garden must be covered to protect it from vermin and other insects, it is advisable to do it with a transparent polythene sheet. Because this polythene sheet, which is transparent, will allow light rays to pass through and the plants will carry out the process of photosynthesis. Our observation was that covering of vegetables with black polythene sheet caused them to develop tiny and yellowish leaves. That was a scientific observation from this situation. And from here, we see that such a phenomenon is called etiolation. And this is usually caused by lack of light during plant growth. Therefore, this our observation was right. If we look at these plants that we have here, this is plant to the left and then the other one to the right, we discover that these are key plants planted at the same time but placed on different conditions. This to the left was placed in the open sun and this was placed in a dark room. And after one week of observation, we see that the one that was placed in the dark had elongated stems and very few leaves and they have very light green coloration, almost yellowish. But that which was placed in the open sun had broad leaves, many leaves which are green and they look fresh and look bulky and healthy compared to the plants to the right. These plants to the right are what we call etiolated plants, and these are healthy growing plants. Therefore, this was what the lady observed. After covering her vegetables with a black polythene sheet, this was what she observed after one week. And if they were allowed in the open, this was what would have been observed. Therefore, we see that it is difficult to harvest any vegetables from etiolated plants. But if they were allowed or covered 
with transparent quality sheet, this would have been the appearance of her vegetables and she would have harvested. So this is the process we would call etiolation. So we see here that these pea plants, they have elongated stems which look very weak and they are almost whitish to yellowish in color. But the plants that were in the open sun have thick stems that look stronger, resistant, and with fresh green leaves. Also, like we're talking about etiolation, this would be a harmful practice to any vegetable farmer, covering them with a dark cloth. If we look at these plants that have been drawn here, we see that this gives us the difference between an etiolated and a non-etiolated plant. Let us look at the internode. That's the distance between two leaves. That's an internode. You see that for an etiolated plant, the internode is longer, and for a non-etiolated plant, it is shorter. We see that, we look at this long internode here from the ground level of the first leaf, and then look at the first node from the ground level to the first leaf, it's quite short. We look at the number of leaves. Here we have five, one, two, three, four, five leaves, and here there are just two. Therefore, if this was a vegetable that needs to be harvested and you need to harvest the leaves, you will have nothing, virtually nothing to harvest from the etiolated plant, but there will be much to harvest from a non-etiolated plant. What does this tell us? This tells us that light is extremely necessary for the process of photosynthesis. And it is the process of photosynthesis that leads to the productivity of our crops. If light is taken away, even if you apply fertilizers to give the most fertile of soils, you will still not have any good yield. Light is very, very necessary. And it also proves to us that it is the process of photosynthesis that leads to the productivity of crops that we can see from here. This therefore supports our hypothesis because the hypothesis was stated that absence of light leads to poor growth of plants. We have seen it in these two examples. Therefore, our hypothesis is supported. We will accept this hypothesis that absence of light leads to poor growth of plants. Therefore, what do we do? Supply ample light to plants that are growing. Let us look at this exercise and see what we could say about it. Maize plants grown around a waste dump looked healthier than those far away from it in the farm. What could account for this observation? This means that there's a farm near a dumping site, but the maize plants that were growing near that waste dump are healthier. But further in the farm, the maize plants which are grown there are less healthier. So what could account for this observation? Maybe on passing, you see that, or a farmer asks you as a human biology student, what would you say? We see that some of the responses could be as follows. Near the waste dump site, much mineral nutrients are produced by decomposition of organic waste. That's why you feel the smell, the scent, as you pass by the waste dump. And you also see maybe water which drips from under with certain coloration because the decay releases those mineral elements and they flow into the farms. Much carbon dioxide is released from decay. Remember, decay is an anaerobic process depending on the bacteria that is causing it because the process of fermentation. When much carbon dioxide is released, what happens to the plant? Remember, in the process of photosynthesis, Plants take up carbon dioxide and release oxygen. Therefore, we have seen the effect of carbon dioxide concentration on the rate of photosynthesis. This implies that these wastes, these materials that are being decomposed, are supplying carbon dioxide. Therefore, what are they doing? They are increasing the concentration of carbon dioxide. And if this concentration of carbon dioxide is increased, what happens to the rate of photosynthesis? It surely increases. But remember, it increases only to optimum. After that, it remains constant and doesn't change. Let's look at the second exercise here. What could account for the fact that crops grown 
in a regulated greenhouse of transparent glass yield much healthier and larger fruits than those grown in the open farm. Remember, grown in a greenhouse with regulated, remember the word regulated, why would they yield much more than the ones that are grown in the open farm? Here are some of the plausible reasonings based on our knowledge of this lesson. Crops do receive optimal light intensity. Remember, the greenhouse has transparent origination. Therefore, light penetrates. Crops are at that point receiving optimal light intensity. The temperature is fairly constant, thus favoring enzymatic activity. Remember, the task was that the greenhouse has controlled environment. Therefore, the plants will have optimal temperature conditions for its growth. Regular irrigation also gives ample soil water. So the plant will have enough soil water and minerals which will enable it to carry out photosynthesis. Remember also the effect of water on the rate of photosynthesis. You can remember photosynthesis where the water molecule is split to release oxygen and OH group. And then solar energy is converted to adenosine triphosphate. If water is available, it will be split. Added fertilizers also supply enough mineral nutrients for the growth of plants. And also, lots of, lots of temperature fluctuations in the open farm will affect the plants negatively compared to a regular temperature control inside the greenhouse. That is why in the temperate regions in Europe, for example, where we have winter seasons, during winter, when the temperatures are as cold as minus 10 degrees, even more than, than that, very freezing temperatures, greenhouses are constructed and crops grew healthily inside these greenhouses because of this controlled temperature environment. Therefore, if you are here in Cameroon or in the tropics and you have very hot temperatures or very cold temperatures, you can construct a greenhouse and then you control the temperature and you will equally have the yields that you want for your crops. It is a possibility to cool down the temperature of your greenhouse, maybe by use of fans or use of cooling methods. There are several of them using electrical energy supply. We also see in this third and last exercise that which of the following statements is true about the effects of light intensity on the rate of photosynthesis? And the statements are as follows. Which of them is true? The first one, A, increase in light intensity decreases the rate of photosynthesis. Increase in light intensity decreases the rate of photosynthesis. Let's reflect on that. The second, increase in light intensity has no effect on the rate of photosynthesis. C, increase in light intensity increases the rate of photosynthesis. And then D, decrease in light intensity increases the rate of photosynthesis. You see that all of them, they are almost looking the same. But what is the most plausible? We see here that C is the most correct of these statements. Increase in light intensity increases the rate of photosynthesis. But in addition, remember, it is only up to optimum. This other example exercise gives us a certain harmony. Let's look at it. The optimal carbon dioxide concentration for photosynthesis could be referred to as, what could it be referred to? Carbon dioxide concentration. We have these statements. The carbon dioxide concentration at which the rate of photosynthesis is lowest. Is that the optimal? B, the carbon dioxide concentration at which the rate of photosynthesis is highest. Hmm? C, the carbon dioxide concentration at which no effect on, which has no effect on the rate of photosynthesis. The carbon dioxide concentration which pollutes the atmosphere. Which of them is the most plausible? So we see that B, at optimal carbon dioxide concentration, the carbon dioxide concentration, it is the carbon dioxide concentration at which the rate of photosynthesis is highest. After this point, no effect on rate of photosynthesis. Therefore, what assignment could we take home? We 
try to reflect on this task and see what we'll bring out. Could water be described as an internal or an external environment or an external factor in relation to photosynthesis? Remember, we had two aspects of factors that affect photosynthesis, external factors and internal factors. Could water be considered an internal factor or an external factor? Reflect on this and we'll see how far we'll go by the next lesson. Here are some of the references that we have consulted and you could visit them and much more. And with this, dear learners, we have come to the end of our lesson. Our next lesson shall be a continuation of the factors affecting the rate of photosynthesis. See you in our next lesson. Un tege si matege yop, un tege minga matege nyum, un tege majang matege ndom, mane tambia ninya ne injubia yen, ngani bana matege mut, ngani la kiri watege ndom, esa kina bia dinki do, mane tambia ninya ne injubia yen, tam tama mote tam zabike. Tam tam a tonge tam zabike tam 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 a mote tam zabike mane tam bia ninya ne injo bia yen 